if I ever make a war movie, I can use this for sound effects from machine guns. <laughs> Captain, Jap Zeros, 12 o'clock high. Well, shoot him, you damn idiot. It's June 2015. Nancy and I have returned to Lake Skinny Atlas. Rain or shine, the most beautiful body of water in the world, where just about everyone and everything is nice. Even the insects that occasionally swarm about your head are neighborly and never bite. And did you notice how I pronounce Skinny Atlas? It's not Skinny Atlas as the town's wonderful writer and historian, Kim Winship, explained to me. Pronounce the name of your town. Scanny Atlas. Okay, you said Scanny. Yes, that's correct. Uh-huh, the old timers <laughs> are gonna love this. All the young people say Skinny. Yeah, well, they're wrong. <laughs> I just say Skinny Atlas. No, Scanny. You wrong pronouncers might not like it, but Kim Winship is exacting in his research. His writing is meticulously backed up with original source material. It's also often very funny. In Scanny Atlas, the character and characters of a lakeside village, Kim writes, One of the more revealing ways to look at Scanny Atlas is through the eyes of others. The earliest recorded glimpse of the village by a visitor dates from 1802. People here appear to be very stupid. Turns out the guy was a disgruntled minister, angry because the townsfolk didn't buy his apocalyptic vision. In any event, I can't recommend Kim Winship enough. His blogs are free, his books aren't, but well worth buying. He is a stickler for finding out the truth of things. The school of Lewis Comfort Tiffany, so it was someone who worked with Tiffany during Tiffany's lifetime, probably from the Tiffany Studios, but not done by Lewis Comfort Tiffany himself. It's not signed. Has your life as a historian affected your idea about human life? You come to understand that everything is temporary. We all look for some sort of permanence or stability, but everything is temporary and the truth will out. <laughs> One of the things I've discovered is that people tend to believe what they want to believe as opposed to what actually happened. So one of the things I try to do is cut through the folklore and get to what actually happened. The whole Stanford White thing, I mean, there were five different houses in this village claimed to be designed by Stanford White and none of them were. One had some interior touches by Stanford White. That's it. Kim has a full-time job. So I asked him, when does he find time to write? Usually between 6 and 7 in the morning, and then 8 and 8.30 at night, mm -hmm. on my lunch hour, on the weekends. So you're not playing golf? <laughs> no, no, only if there's a windmill hole, I'm afraid. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. No. Well, please keep it up. It's, it's so entertaining Thank reading you. your various blogs. Thanks I, so much. Yeah. Kim pointed out all sorts of stuff to us, including a blood relative of the legendary creator of Captain America, Joe H. Simon. The relative did not want to appear in my movie, so I disguised him or her in my photograph. I love Captain America. In his 2011 New York Times obituary, Simon is quoted talking about his first job as a retoucher for Paramount Pictures. I retouched some of the most famous bosoms in motion pictures. Gloria Swanson, Joan Crawford, Betty Davis, Carol Lombard, and Dorothy L'Amour. Good bosom men were considered experts and got lots of work. I could hold up a sagging bus line with the best of them. Karen McGee at the Skinny Atlas Historical Society, otherwise known as the Creamerines. We're gonna give the nickel tour today. All right, so, let's get started. This is the nickel started. tour, yeah. <laughs>
but we call it the creamery because all the local farmers would bring their milk in their cans because they didn't have the ability to process. They'd sell it here and it would be made into butter and mm -hmm. ice cream and things like that here. Mm -hmm. Revolutionary War soldiers were given 100 acre plots of land as payment. Most of the people who settled this part of New York State were from Connecticut, Revolutionary War oh. soldiers. So this is mainly agriculture. Agriculture is still a very big part of what we do. One of the reasons the lake is so clean, we have a much smaller watershed than some of the other Finger Lakes, which lends itself to the cleanliness. In 1898, the city of Syracuse said, well, we need more water. We want we like the clean water out here. So they went to Albany and said, can we take Skinny Atlas Lake water? And Albany said, sure. And so the townspeople woke up and there's people out digging a pipe. Like, what are you doing? Oh, City of Syracuse, we're taking your water. 40 million gallons a day. And it's still a sore spot for this town, town and village. In addition to agriculture, there's a lot of transportation here. The Packwood carriages, they made sleighs and carriages. We have examples here. Mm -hmm. And the Sherwood Inn, that's where that was headquartered, with the shop across the street, oh, where the park is okay. now. Well, this is a very upscale sleigh, probably your top of the line model. It's wood with metal. Mm -hmm. wow. So, you get your bells, and then this would have been your foot warmer to put your clothes oh, in. Yeah. Welch Allen came in in the mm -hmm. 1930s, and they're still here uh, making uh, medical instruments. And the Allen family is still very, very involved, very active. They give a lot of money to the creamery. Pre-industrial revolution, we were the largest teasel producer in the country. Everybody grew them as a cash crop. This is called a teasel drum. You would weave your wool, right? and when your wool was woven, you'd put it on this, You'd turn the drum, it would pull it along, and it pulled the nap up. It made it into polar, oh, like polar fleece. Look at that. So people were smarter than you thought. So it made it more water and wind resistant. Yeah. The south end of the lake, 1890s, curative powers, mm -hmm. the Glen Haven area or Fairhaven area. Yeah. There was a hotel, Curative Springs, mm -hmm. and there were three steamboats that went on the lake here. Roosevelt Hall, if you're, it's a private family now, private residence yes. now, as it had been. In the 40s and 50s, it actually was owned by the Catholic Church, and an order of oh. monks lived there. The original builders were Roosevelt's of the Long Island Roosevelt's. Yeah, yeah. Teddy Eleanor's side. Yeah, yeah, we so, were. And Eleanor did visit. Karen took us into the section of the creamery devoted to the boat building history of Skinny Atlas. Three different boat companies worked here building everything from canoes to racing boats. One boat is particularly famous. Probably what we're most known for is the Skinny Atlas boats, which were in business a little over 30 years, because they got into the sailing racers. And they were commissioned to build a faster, small racing boat. And they got a designer from Connecticut, and he came up with the Lightning. And the Lightning is the number one recreational racing boat in the world. There are more lightnings than any other sailboat in the world, and it was designed and built here in, by the Skinny Atlas Boat Company. Karen was such a pleasant guide with her mellifluous upstate New York accent, but I detected just a soup song of Philadelphia in her voice. I moved, we moved in 91, so 24 years. So is this better than Philadelphia? Uh, I love Philadelphia. It's all very different. Yeah. I mean, oh, the yeah. thing is, it's, it's much cheaper cost of living here. Really? That's for sure. Did you oh, live in yeah. the village? Or? Um, I live in the town, but it's still much cheaper. Explain the relationship of town and village. Um, well, the village is the immediate area that gets serviced by um, village services. Like, they have sewer here. I'm on septic in sewer water. They get garbage pickup we don't. They have a mayor and we have a town supervisor. So they get certain amenities, but their taxes are higher. In a final act of tour guiderly kindness, Karen recommended a wonderful restaurant called Daniel's Grill. It was a few miles north of Scanny Atlas in a town called Marcellus. Very good food and our waitress gave us an excellent tip of what to do after dinner. Kim Winship explained that many of the towns up here were named by a Revolutionary War era clerk in the land surveyor's office who was a fan of Greco-Roman history. Hence, Homer, Brutus, Cato, Aurelius, and Marcellus. 
and you just won't find a more wholesome place than Marcellus, New York. What's going on here? Uh, we're what? at the Old Home Days in Marcellus. The what? Old Home Days. What does that mean? It's a carnival, pretty much. We have rides and food and music and dancing. And fireworks. And fireworks. There's fireworks today. Fireworks coming at 10. And has Marcellus been your old home since you were born? Yep. Yes. This is a nice place to live. Yes. Wonderful place to live. What's a spidey? Speedy. Speedy. It's a uh, chicken cooked in State Fair Speedy sauce from Owego, New York. Sounds good. Be I'm careful. too stuffed for dinner and I eat it, but I'd love to <laughs> try one someday. We'll have them tomorrow. I'll have Vicky take okay, a picture thanks. of my Have you ever had a, a Speedy? A what? A Speedy. Never That's heard of it. a sandwich, it. right? Some kind of chicken sandwich. I think so. Was it good? Uh, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> One evening, after gorging ourselves on the excellent fare at Doug's Fish Fry, Nancy and I were strolling down a street doing some twilight bird watching, and we heard a loud, Hi, John. <laughs> I'm bird watching at night in Skinny Atlas, and who are you, sir? I'm Walter, Walter D. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoyed your video, it was wonderful. <laughs> well, you're gonna be in my next one. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Walter invited us to visit him in his hometown of Auburn. Last year's Auburn tour included the homes of William Seward and Harriet Tubman. But this would be another kettle of fish entirely. Walter told us to meet him for lunch at Connie's Tex-Mex Barbecue, his favorite restaurant. You can't miss it, he said. It's right next to the prison. Guards outside the Auburn Correctional Facility told me not to film it. I could have read them the riot act about my artistic freedom, but have had a lifelong fear of ending up in such a place, so I held my tongue. On the top is a statue of a Revolutionary War soldier named Copper John. Prisoners are said to be, quote, working for Copper John. A few years back, they brought him down for refreshing, and he had a little bulge in his crotch, and now he doesn't have quite the appendages that he used to. <laughs> That's right. They castrated Copper John, despite the efforts of a group of guards who made t-shirts featuring a very powerful message. Now onto a more pleasant topic. Connie's food may well have been the best of any we had at the Finger Lakes, and she is simply a fantastic human being. I've been coming to see Connie and have her delicious food for 21 years, and it's a wonderful place to come. It's like halfway between my office and my home, so it's very easy to stop in two, three times a week at least. My restaurant is called Connie's Deli. It's a Mexican restaurant, Tex-Mex. And what are your specialties? We got flautas. Flautas is the one special everybody likes. Chile rellenos, enchiladas, uh, tacos, chalupas, green sauce, mole sauce, quesadillas. We got a lot of stuff. There's my husband in the kitchen. You are a great cook, sir. Well, thank you. You made that soup? Yeah. 
And your name is? Doug. Man, this is one of the best restaurants we've eaten oh, since wow. we've come to the Finger Lakes. Nice. That's <laughs> nice to hear. Do any of the prisoners ever escape and come directly for some plow toss? <laughs> no, not yet. <laughs> Do you deliver to the prison? Yes, not for the inmates, only for the guards. And do they like your food? Oh, they love it. They love it. Yep. Honey, yep. is this man one of the prison guards? No, he's not. <laughs> okay, Walter, so you're not a prison guard. Let's hear your story. My name is Walt Dungy, and I'm one of the family members that still runs Auburn Leather Crafters in Auburn, New York. We are the oldest dog collar manufacturing company in the United States. My grandfather, Everett Dungy, started the business in 1950. My brother, Alan, is partners with his wife, Anita, with me in this business. Alan gave us a tour of the plant. Chris over here, he's cutting our Tuscany collars, and uh, that's made out of an Italian upholstery leather with a nice soft pebble grain cowhide lining. So the, the hides come in all tanned and colored. This is a, a chestnut bridal leather, and burgundy bridal leather, and black bridal leather. Mm. These are all tanned down in uh, near State College, Pennsylvania. What is tanning? You've all had a cup of tea. What makes the tea brown is the tannins. It's a preservative. And that stamps the uh, handle out. The swing arm press operates like a giant cookie cutter. The raw edge of the leather showing. We either dye or paint and seal the edges. Adam's working on taking that natural raw edge and made it blue. It is a leather paint specifically designed to adhere to the leather and to be flexible with the leather as a dog wears it. It's basically just a compressor. You know, it kind, of, kind of folds it, folds it in. Yeah. This is Walter's daughter, Erin. I am riveting collars, which is putting this piece in here. Oh, okay. What's it like working for your dad and your uncle? <laughs> Be nice now. <laughs> um, a dream come true? Yes, a dream come true. <laughs> How many collars do you make a week? On an annual basis, close to 1,000. 200,000? Mm -hmm. Wow. Collars are originally designed to put on dogs that might be attacked by an aggressive dog, and it's a way to keep the dog from damaging the neck of the dog that's wearing the collar. You have a subset of very kinky dog collars, not for dogs, but for fellow human beings. <laughs> no, we leave that to the Amish. <laughs> <laughs> Is that true? Kinda. <laughs> it's been rumored. <laughs> The company has survived two huge threats, a fire and a power grab from some well-heeled boys. There was a fire many years ago and it approached our building. While our building didn't burn down, we did suffer a little bit of damage. All of our exterior windows that had this diamond leaded glass were destroyed by the heat of the fire. Anita won an epic David versus Goliath battle. Though reluctant, this modest woman eventually told me her tale. It was a fluke, really. I had just come to work for the company a few months before. About six months after being here, we'd signed up for an industry newsletter. I just opened it one day and saw the headline that there was the possibility of tariffs being eliminated on dog collars and leashes and, and pet products. I knew that wasn't a good thing for small business. I, I uh, come to find out it was, it was Walmart that was behind the push to eliminate the tariffs. I formulated a letter with the help of a friend of mine who was familiar with politics. I talked with Senator Schumer's office, a representative of his came here. My friend was a huge help in getting the word to the right people. Sent my letters, was contacted by someone from the ITC. He quietly whispered, he said, I have a friend who 
works for the Washington Post. Would you be interested in talking with him? Well, I, up to that point, I'd been a stay-at-home mom. We live in the country. I didn't even receive the newspaper, so I didn't really even know what the Washington Post was. And again, this is small town Auburn. I don't even know if it's delivered here other than online. So I, I spoke with the reporter. We did the interview and he told me it was front page above the fold. I didn't really even know the, the lingo at that point, but so as it turned out, it was a pretty big story. Uh, the, the omnibus uh, tariff bill did not pass. So Excellent. I was pretty pleased with that. It was, it was definitely a, a win for small business. It is an uphill battle. It's a fight every day. And for a small business like ours to stay on top of things is, is almost a full-time job in itself. But where well, there's a will, there's a way. So that's what we're, we're plugging along at, striving for every day, because um, I don't think my husband could find a place anywhere else, find a home, something that's true to his heart, like, like this business is. A place where you can work and your son can pump iron. What mother would w- <laughs> want anything better than that? Absolutely. It is, it's a wonderful life. This is uh, Alan's son Christopher's workout equipment. I'm playing the and, part of Christopher now. And you be careful over there, John. That's that's a lot of weight. That's oh. that's a lot of weight. <clears throat> I'm just gonna try one. You know, hand. just just. Well. Yeah. And so Nancy and I love the Dungy family, and as we were leaving with some great swag for the dogs in our lives. Walt suggested that we visit an iconic Auburn watering hole. Where are we? You're at Swabby's Tavern, internationally known. And that's Elaine, she's a queen. And why do you have a gorilla in your establishment? It doesn't everybody. Wow, good comeback. And that's a female too, can you tell? She needs a trim though, it's a Sasquatch. This is just a replica of the original electric chair, and Auburn had the first electric chair in the, in the country. We did the first. Did any of your customers get the chair? Some of them should have. No. <laughs> yeah. Nancy's just can't function without her three o'clock. Swerve. Swerve. <laughs> Not true. Just joking. I, on the other hand. In reality, we aren't bar people. But when a bar is as much a museum as it is a place to get your swerve on, then we feel right at home. Elaine told us that Swabi's current owner is a Mr. Pacini. His son told me about the first owner. My name is Michael Pacini. All these amazing objects, where are they from? Uh, Mike Dwyer was an antique dealer and he decorated it with all of his personal belongings, I think. I'm Art Wenzel. I'm a local uh, music promoter, former features editor at the paper. And uh, there's a lot of history here in Auburn, New York. Theater Case created sound on film, so he kind of put uh, Charlie Chaplin out of business. His museum is still here in town. Uh, back in the 30s, there used to be like a dozen theaters in town. The Palace Theater, the Burtis Opera House held 3,000 people. People used to come from all over, from Chicago, New York City, come up here for the big shows. As you see, some of the posters in here even have some of the blessed shows. William Seward, who bought Alaska for the United States, Harry Tubman's here, uh, Theodore Case Mansion. So there's there's a lot of good things going on here. And the wineries are, they're all over the place now. Mike Dwyer seems to have had a keen appreciation for anatomy, both animal and human. The ladies' room features art greatly pleasing to the feminine eye. I asked Mike Pacini a final question. Do you ever have the bear dusted off a little bit? (laughs) Once in a while. (laughs) Nancy and I heard about the Charlie Major Nature Trail, and on a beautiful afternoon, we walked it. It is a little north of the village where lots of mills used to operate. This is such a beautiful little trail. The Boy Scouts just came through at the beginning of like the nice weather 
They walk up in the trails. That's why there's so many of these flowers. They spread the seeds. How do you get a nature trail named after you? Well, I got to talk to Charlie Major, who gave me the scoop. All errors in this account are my own. Charlie is a retired New York State Supreme Court Justice. There's a mandatory retirement age, but he said you can extend it if you pass a rigorous mental test. It's multiple choice with only one question. In 2004, he retired, and nine hours and 22 minutes later, he was appointed as a Scanny Atlas Town Justice. Charlie told me it's widely believed that Syracuse bribed politicians to allow them to seize the lake water. When the water grabbers from Syracuse first arrived, they were scared off by the Scanny Atlas militia who aimed their cannon at them. Later, the town passed a law saying it was illegal to dig holes and they'd arrest the Syracusians if they dared put a shovel into the ground. But alas, the water war ended with Syracuse bullying their way in. Only Syracuse and the village of Skinny Atlas had access to the water. The people just north of the village used the flow of the creek to run their mills. Syracuse reduced their flow, and these folk not only were hurt economically, but typhus started to break out. Charlie's dad and a doctor, Greg, got a lawmaker to slip some language in an unrelated bill to get more water to help these people. It was passed and signed by the governor, and so the people, quote, down the road, got some relief. Charlie's dad and some friends bought the Five Mile Short Line Railroad back in 1940. Eventually, they sold it to a chemical company. Charlie talked the chemical company into donating this tract of land to the town. Charlie said, it helps if you are nice to people. Charlie had a lawyer friend named Jack Bryant who had bought some land near the Mottville Bridge. Jack and his wife moved away and they too donated their land to the town and these two tracts of land became the current nature trail. Though named after him, Charlie says it's his father who should get the credit for the nature trail. Now I can see why people around here don't like Syracuse, but Syracuse does have a pretty wonderful art museum with an incredibly nice ceramics collection. Nancy and I had a great time wandering through the Everson Museum of Art. So should we forgive Syracuse? Well, it helps to be nice to people. So you're at the Everson. This was built by I.M. Pei who also built the Louvre. You're in the heart of downtown Syracuse, surrounded by some other cool stuff, like the fountain outside. There's this beautiful spiral staircase. This a beautiful horse, I don't know. And how long have you been working here? I just graduated. I worked as an intern all semester, and then I got promoted to the gift shop <laughs> as a, a paid employee. I have a kind of a philosophical question. Yeah. Why is everyone nice up here? I'm glad that you've had that experience. <laughs> I've lived here my entire life and I still love it here and so I guess I must have had the same experience. I'm, I'm avoiding your question I guess. I don't know why everyone is nice but I I like that. But most people do seem pretty nice right here. Yeah, I guess so. Oh, love you. Thank you so Thanks much. Thanks for putting me in your movie. One of the great pleasures of our trip last year was meeting Robert and Betsy Eibert. Robert is a retired farmer whose art installation stopped us in our tracks when we accidentally drove down the country road where it is situated. I went back to see how his art is progressing, but the story he told me has a gravity and darkness to it which demands to be in a different movie. I asked Olivia, why is everyone nice up here? Well, 
Maybe that's not true. In any event, we had two very fun adventures with the Iberts. The Iberts arranged for Nancy and I to visit Westlake Conservators, which was founded by sisters Susan Blakeney and Margaret Sutton in 1975. We've been working on artwork for people from all over central New York and beyond for 40 years. So what kinds of art do you restore? We restore paintings and frames and textile pieces, photographs and watercolors and other paper-based artifacts and murals, et cetera, et cetera. Whatever somebody brings, if we think we can do it, we'll try. And if we can't, we'll find somebody else who can or try and learn how we might be able to do it. Where did you guys learn how to do this? Well, my sister learned in London. She was an apprentice there for six years in a studio where she had a lot of work on old master paintings, reconstructing them because old master paintings are so old, they've been worked on many times throughout their existence. You probably treat less valuable paintings just as well as the more valuable ones? Absolutely. The value is all in the mind of the owner, really, whether it's sentimental or uh, monetary. We've worked on murals from San Francisco, uh, paintings from the Flying Horse Carousel in Martha's Vineyard, but mostly from around here. The staff that we met are extremely well-trained, knowledgeable, and dedicated. This is a world-class operation. We would go into the Uffizi and do lovely reproductions of old masters. Are um, you the resident art historian looker-upper? No, we all are. I'm Italian, and I did my master's in Italy, and so I, that's my... That's my love. My name is Moya Dumville. I'm the paper conservator with Westlake Conservators. In mostly in paper conservation, we work with fairly inert things. You know, a peroxide bleach is probably the, the strongest chemical that I would work with, and I have masks. We've been fit tested and by proper safety measures. Other than that, it's basically just acetone or isopropanol. Are they nice to you? Yeah. Do they feed they are you? They are lovely. They feed me very well. Are you paid? I'm paid, it's yes. It's not just that you're not an angel. I'm not just doing it because I love my work. I, I'm but doing you do it as a job, but I do love my work. I do. All right. All right. Just checking. Margaret told me the story of the largest painting that they have ever restored. Henry Sandom painted this huge March of Time painting, and he visited each of the individuals in the portrait that were identified and did small portraits of them. And it was in the possession of the Smithsonian Institute. Henry Sandom was a Canadian artist because it wasn't painted by an American artist. They were auctioning it off, and nobody bid on it because it's so huge. But there was one person who really was interested in it, and he was related to one of the subjects in the painting. So he and his brother put up the funds to actually purchase it from the Smithsonian at a very modest cost. But then he had to put in quite a bit of money, and we put in many hours of work to bring it back to exhibition state. And in the years that we were working on it, the Harley-Davidson showroom was built and a special place, a wall, for it to be displayed. What a great story. Here is General Sherman, conqueror of Atlanta. But it wasn't his relatives who saved this painting. No, it was the relatives of a little guy, Private Joseph Smolinski, who made sure that Harley buyers in a Virginia showroom can gaze in wonder at the army that conquered their great, great grandpappies. Our final evening, we went to dinner with the Iberts to the Aurora Inn on Lake Cayuga. It had been raining all day, but when we got there, the sun came out and the beauty of the world shone all about us. It was a magical night of wonderful food and friendship. Inns of Aurora, built in 1833 by E.B. Morgan. We do have two other properties, bed and breakfast, the uh, E.B. Morgan house and the Roland House. Henry Wells and his wife founded Wells College in Aurora, New York for girls. He was the founder of Wells Fargo and he and Mr. Morgan who owned the inn started American Express. And this was a busy port 
There was a grist mill down at the bottom by the lake. The farmers would bring their grains in and they would get on the barge after they were milled and go up through the Erie Canal because this lake is connected to the Erie Canal. The building was totally restored around 2000. Westlake conservators took care of the murals and restored them and they're downstairs in our lakeside room. My name is Brittany Paul and I'm going to tell you about the mural behind me. This is Wells College. The main building in the center, which you see, is main building. It's actually burnt down three times. This is the Wells Fargo carriage and we use it during the Aurora Fest and during graduation time. The students get in the carriage and they come down to graduation with their families. The building way over here on your left is Glen Park. But Henry Wells' home actually was a mansion and then it later turned into a residence hall. Right now it is an all women's dorm. The building over to our right side is Pettibone. When the owner was originally here, he had his mistress living there. And so there's a great story about at Glen Park, he had a light up on the top of his house and he would turn it on when his wife was away so that would signal that the mistress could come over. They teach stuff like that to you guys yes, in that college? Yes, we have a great bunch of stories in college. We have it's supposed to be haunted and everything. The main building is frequently where people will see the ghost in the third floor bathroom in the crossbar. Somebody was looking in the mirror and there was a press down and it was like a hand imprint on their shoulder and they won't ever go to that bathroom anymore. So that was one sighting. The ghost will take stuff and move it around the room and if they're mean to the ghost, it won't give it back. Listening to Brittany's stories of illicit love and ghosts while simultaneously thinking about the art upstairs, I was beginning to feel a vibe from Stanley Kubrick's The Shining. But it didn't seem to bother this plucky Wells woman a bit. Is your college pretty good? I love my college, it's home to me. Another brave woman who attended Wells College decades ago has become a major benefactor to her school. In 2013, she bought the Aurora Inns from her alma mater. She has also brought much joy into the hearts of those of us in the doll-loving community. Our owner, Pleasant Roland, had created the American Girl doll from her books. Is her name really Pleasant? Yes. Is she, in fact, a pleasant person? She is. I was a huge fan of American Girl Doll. I had like five or six of them, so going to school where American Girl Doll was found, it was really cool. I've been waiting for her to come into the inn to tell her how much I love American Girl Doll. <laughs> With Amber's love of dolls, I wondered what she's studying. It turns out she's majoring in math and wants to go on to graduate school. I'm actually getting a PhD in psychometrics, which is the um, statistical work behind education. Pleasant Roland would be pleased, but not surprised. Her books and dolls have inspired countless young people. And when she sold her company to Mattel for $700 million, she ended up investing heavily in Aurora and Wells College. She bought the Mackenzie Child's Ceramics Company and returned it to profitability. She plans for her Aurora Inns to become an anchor for regional tourism and economic development. In my book, with her generous spirit, Pleasant Roland fits right into the Finger Lakes tradition of great American women. Hey Nancy, look at the lake, it has this funny color in the middle. Why do Nancy and I love Skinny Atlas so much? It's a lake of miracles. Oh, oh you big dummy. Oh, <laughs> oh, man. It's like jumping into a vat of ice water. One morning there's mist, and another, a rainbow inside the water. But beyond the physical enchantment of the natural world, it's the people who live here who have captured our hearts.
my name is Robin, and uh, my dog's name is Chloe, and uh, this is my girlfriend, Shawnee. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Hi, Shawnee. Hi. <laughs> nice dog. Nice to meet you. Now this is America's future. <laughs> All right, so where are you going, young man? I'm deploying to Africa. How long are you going to be there? Nine months to a year. Not sure yet. All right, young lady, does this make you overjoyed? <laughs> well, I knew get what I was getting into, and I promised I would wait, so. You guys, all my <laughs> irony and joking aside, thank you for just what you're doing. You're welcome. And like Robin, Nancy and I shall return to Scanny Atlas.